Well, you know I gotta get the camera doing its thing. Oh. Right. You should start sitting it on top of people's desks. Yeah, like what they put. Oh my gosh. I know that's Chipotle, aren't you? <laughs> I gotta make sure I get my Chipotle <laughs> so that I can eat it in front of the rest of the class. <laughs> like a really nice. Uh, Okay, so, um, so hey, uh, all right, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, your, it's my turn. You had your time. You had 15 minutes to talk internally. <laughs> Work on that quiz. No, <laughs> so your, your midterm is next Tuesday. And um, I, I have a proposal. And that is that uh, I am going to base the midterm off of your homework assignments and homework quizzes hitherto, all the solutions of which are posted on the website. So if you make it a point to understand the ins and outs and all of all that, then you should be fine for your exam next Tuesday. Most of it you've already worked on, right? So it's really revisiting and it's completing. And part of this is because I know you guys get so sick of working on these homework assignments that I either turn around and post the solutions and no one looks at them. <laughs> okay? And part of me wonders, why do I post solutions? Why do I even post solutions to the quizzes? Why do I do any of this? <laughs> but, but I think that for you, in having spent so much time, invested so much time in doing the homework and then in coming in and trying the quizzes, um, it's worth your time to go back and, and, and flesh out any details that you might have missed, um, any mistakes that you might have made. And so, uh, so between now and next Tuesday, you should have a look that, you know, it's seven homework assignments and seven quizzes. It's not that much, um, especially if you don't have to do it all from scratch, okay? So, uh, so uh, that's, that's basically what should form your study material for the exam Tuesday. Yes, Spencer. So are you actually going to complete the exam before you give it to us so you know that it's not going to take us to write out the book wrong again? Yeah, yeah, I will, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you asked me that question, but yeah, yeah. I mean, in previous history, you know, you'll give us assignments and then you realize much later that, oh wait, that's quite tedious. <laughs> well, no, 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 a homework yeah, assignment is different from an in-class assignment. Those are supposed to be. Yeah, the homework <laughs> assignment. Well, the, the, thing, the thing about homework assignments is I feel like um, if it's going to be long, it should be at least, I'm going to say this and you're all going to laugh. It should at least be relatively straightforward in the sense of you're just doing something. But if you're solving a really hard problem, a lot of times those are not long problems. They just take time for you to kind of figure out and process. And, um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, ultimately, as a physicist solving real world problems, you're going to do long, non, just, you know, straightforward kind of calculations. Um, but Carolyn. Is there, like, are there any really big concepts that you're like, you should... Well, I was yeah. actually, uh, what I, that's kind of what I was going to start with today, because now is the point, <laughs> I wonder if that's blood. Uh -huh. Am I bleeding? <laughs> There's blood on my finger. That's not good. Okay, anyway. Um, so, um, if, you know, if like Carrie, you know, his blood starts streaming, you might ought to let me know. Uh, we'll uh, figure out where that's coming from. Okay, so um, so I've heard a lot of students, you know, say there's a lot to digest, uh, and and it's, there is a lot to digest in this course. And I have to say, for any of you who didn't take general relativity, actually, let's just have this discussion. But for those who did take general relativity, and for the sake of those who didn't, um, and just in terms of sort of the sheer amount of stuff that you've been expected to process, and bear in mind this is thus far for this course, um, do you feel like there's sort of more things to integrate in this class? Versus general relativity, I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. Oh, like order of magnitude. Yeah. <laughs> so I heard order of magnitude more things in this class than in general relativity, but Kowalski seems to have. Well, no, I mean, I don't know. Descent. I just feel like the math is pretty similar. But is that what you're talking about? Like, there's more concepts. Math right? is certainly an important part of it, but I think this is easier because we've already seen some of it. Ashley, get Aha! So, so, so Ashley thinks that this is actually a little bit easier because of what you saw in general relativity. So, in, in, in light of that, those of you who have not taken general relativity, you know, should kind of keep that in mind. And these two courses do, uh, not everybody gets the opportunity to take both of them because they're off every other year. But if you take one, then it certainly facilitates the other one because I try and sort of present them in the unity of ideas between them, even though they're ostensibly different topics. So, um, 
<laughs> just start passing it around the room, Wolf King, because we'll all get the bite. Some might just lick it, just to get their, anyway, flavor effects. Okay, um, my students are really bad about bringing stuff and not sharing with the class, so. Um, only 25 cents. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay. So, so in, in reality, um, so what I wanted to do is sort of kind of give you a rundown on uh, this, this blood thing's really making me nervous. Um, on, uh, on, on kind of what we've done so far, because this is a point where the course is going to change drastically. And this is very similar to general relativity, where we set up a lot of formalism. We like defined tensors and tensors on curved spaces and what manifolds were and differential calculus and differential geometry. And we did all of that machinery just to get to Einstein's equation. And then after that, we spent time just studying solutions to Einstein's equations. And we saw a lot of cool stuff like black holes and, and uh, tests of general relativity and cosmological solutions and so forth. Well, the same thing's about to happen here. What we've done so far is we have set up all of the formalism to kind of motivate what we can expect to see in the standard model. And that's been a lot of foundational stuff. Like we had to figure out what spinners were, how they uh, contrasted with vectors, or how they contrasted with scalars. And of course, we now know that all three of those play an important role. Come on, kids. Uh, in the standard model. All right. And now we also know sort of the origin of the structure of the, the, the three interactions we're going to be studying. Okay, and now is kind of when we put, um, put the rubber to the road and start doing calculations, and in particular, this is where we make contact with experiment, because after all, this is an experimental science. And in, in really appreciating this subject, by the way, and I want to stress this to you, um, you have been spared what I believe is the most painful way to learn this, which is from the historical perspective. The historical perspective starts out, you know, late, 18th century and then proceeds with a lot of growth throughout the 20th century or late 19th century but proceeds with a lot of growth throughout the 20th century where quantum mechanics was discovered relativity was discovered and and spinners were discovered and antimatter was discovered but no one really knew what the hell was going on and there were all these particles and you know is, is this thing different from this thing no they're actually the same thing is this made of something no it's not oh yes it is things are made of things uh, and it's a really confusing thing to study the history of particle physics it's much easier, and I encourage you to do it, to, after you've sort of understood what's going on in the standard model, to go back and review its history. Especially like the period from the 50s to like the 80s. Because there was just a lot of seeming complexity that really just kind of got wrapped up in this final story of SU3 cross SU2 left cross U1 with the Higgs mechanism for spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, so anyway, so kind of as a review of the foundational stuff that we've gotten set up, um, just, a, just a quick reminder, you know, we started everything out uh, with a preference that we would see the role of symmetry, um, or that we would see symmetry play a very big role throughout this course, and hopefully by now you agree with that. Uh, we used symmetry both in the guise of space-time transformations, to A, define what we mean by special relativity, because special relativity is the sort of mechanics context in which we're uh, going to be doing calculations, because particles are generally going to move at very high speeds and accelerators. And we're also going to be have to, having to deal with mass, massless particles, which are necessarily relativistic. So it's nice to see that relativity can really be uh, uh, summarized as a statement about the uh, invariance of various space-time quantities under the Lorentz group of transformations, this SO1 comma 3. And then um, we sort of generalized uh, to other possible groups, because after all, if we're going to go through the machinery of defining groups and so forth, and so we, we looked at some complex groups, and in particular, we've now discovered that uh, these groups play an important role in the standard model uh, in their association with the forces. Okay. So all of that development we did about group theory and representations of groups and how a group can be uh, non-trivial in one situation but trivial in another, all of that has been, was set up uh, for uh, its application to relativity and then to the gauge forces. Remember, at the end of the day, every single particle that we are going to talk about 
has got to fall into some representation of all four of these groups. So for example, uh, and I'm not going to pose this as a question, someone can just say the answer if they want. Um, what is an electron in this context? <coughs> some, one person raise your hand and answer the question. Go Kowalski, I saw you raise your hand. I suppose you should say it's charged, it's matter, so it's a dirac fermion, so it's got U1 and... It's got, a, it's charged under this group. Right, and then it's got... Sorry, if this is E and M, I should say. Well, uh, well, we'll say this is E and M. And we'll say this is the left-handed uh, electroweak part, but go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say it's also gonna have the mass of the, the, the diamond equation, um, which is a, I forget the symmetry, but that's cool. Well, oh, okay, okay, so, so, uh, so, so, yeah, maybe I should say, um, so SO13 is technically the set of matrices that act on tensors um, or tensor indices, and then there's the associated set of spin transformations, okay? So uh, the electron, for example, is a spinner in space time. So if I do a rotation in space in the space-time coordinates, it will transform with the action of this set of transformations. It's a scalar or a singlet under the strong interaction. The electrons don't feel the strong interaction. It's part of a doublet with the electron neutrino here. And then it's charged under the U1 for electromagnetism. And then, of course, if I said quark, and you might not know all the details about quarks, but quarks are also spinners. They are part of triplets under the strong interactions. They are part of doublets under the weak interactions, at least the left-handed quark states. And they also carry electric charge as well. So quarks are really interesting because they're sort of non-trivial under everything. Okay? So that's why we spent so much time sort of digging into groups and group representations. And then we also, of course, uh, took all of this and went a little bit further and we kind of had to in order to unearth the spin representations, but we also found it coming later. Um, we took our, our group analysis and extended it to the idea of Lie groups and Lie algebras. And the, the construction of Lie algebras is really where we got to, to see that there was another way of thinking about space-time transformations instead of this SO1 comma 3 ohm tensor indices. Instead, you could use uh, spin transformations in spin space and it turns out that nature uses those representations. And we know all matter particles are, are spinners, and so they transform into the spin representations. But we've also gotten a mileage out of this because when we studied the gauge forces, we know that the generators of the various groups here, which show up in the Lie algebra, remember the Lie algebra of a of a group is just the commutation relation of its generators. So if I'm doing SU2, that's just given by the levi civita symbol. In general, it's the structure constants. But what we know is that uh, for each generator in the, in the Lie algebra of the group, we get a corresponding gauge field in the uh, version of each of these symmetry groups once they've been localized. Okay, so we've been using these ideas that we kind of laid out at the beginning of the course. And I have to say, maybe in condensed matter, you use a lot of group theory and representation theory, but it doesn't pop up in, in too many different areas in physics, quite like it does in particle physics. Um, okay, so, so uh, once we kind of realized that particles um, have to be in some representation of the space-time transformations. We really focused on three cases, spin zero, and we wrote down the Klein-Gordon equation, okay, for spin zero fields or scalar fields. Uh, there's spin a half, which we found were described by the Dirac equation. Of course, each of these equations has a corresponding Lagrangian. And then for spin one, uh, we have the Proca equation or the Proca Lagrangian, okay? And now we know that uh, all the gauge fields are spin one, all matter is spin a half, and the Higgs is a spin zero. So all of these are going to play an important role in the standard model. And then we spend a lot of time and energy, particularly starting with the rack fields, and uh, setting them up to have these global symmetries and then gauging those symmetries. So we created gauged or localized.
And what we argued was that the Lagrangians that come out of that actually encode the form of the interactions. And we're going to see really nice pictorial representations of those in the weeks to come when we start doing calculations. Okay, so some of those, like Lagrangians that I wrote down and they were big and nasty and you're just like, Ugh. okay, we're going to revisit them and we're going to see, like if I look at a term, how can I interpret what that term is actually doing? Okay, I might give you a, a, a small preview of that today. Um, okay, and then and then to kind of to kind of cap it off, we had this this problem that we ran into that if you want to build everything based on these gauge symmetries, you run into a problem with the weak interactions because the weak bosons are massive as we observe them, and this always requires basis bosons. And then it turns out that because this acts on left-handed spin states only, in fact, the mass of any matter fermion can't, has to be zero okay, for this symmetry to be good. And that led us to this idea that this particular SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge is actually a spontaneously broken symmetry. And in the process of that symmetry breaking at some point in the past of the universe, uh, it was broken in conjunction with the Higgs mechanism, which we of course have spent the last week talking about, uh, which is this really new and interesting uh, non-perturbative phenomenon. It's, a, it's this big thing that happened in the universe everywhere. And uh, it is responsible both for the breaking of that symmetry, that's why we don't see it now, um, and also where all the masses of the gauge bosons and the particles came from. Okay. So that's this kind of a synopsis of where we've gotten so far. And of course, there's a lot of detail in this. You know, you, you all hate spinners. Um, and, and it's okay. Nobody, nobody leaves an undergraduate education in physics comfortable with spinners. Most people don't leave a PhD in physics comfortable with spinners. Um, but, uh, you know, just I, I'm hoping, if nothing else, that you kind of see at least the theme that symmetry's been playing throughout at least the first part of this course. Okay. Um, all right. So, what we're going to turn to now, and, and I, I, I promise you, like, I, I couldn't stand up here and write down all of the equations that we've been, you know, working with from, you know, from out of my head. It's not. It's the one thing about general relativity. There's there's kind of only a few equations, <laughs> so you can almost memorize them. Uh, but in this class, no, I don't know. It's way way too hard. Right. Um, and in this, there's no there's no relation of mass to gravity. Uh, no relation of mass to gravity. What do you mean? In, in all of this that we've done so far, like there's no mention of gravity. Yeah. yeah, there's no gravity in the standard model. Right. So the the the. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. So so that's a really interesting question. So um, how how do you do the standard model of physics without gravity? You know, that's that's can you even do that? Well, first of all. It, it depends on the question you're asking, right? So the questions where gravity is actually important, this is not important. So when, a, when, when you jump off the building, the strong interactions really don't matter. <laughs> Electromagnetism matters once you hit the ground. But in terms of what you're doing in the air, it's just gravity. Conversely, when these things really matter, especially these two, Gravity is irrelevant because when you have an accelerator and you're looking at a small number of very, very tiny mass particles moving with very high energies, these interactions are actually significantly stronger than the gravitational interaction. And so in the, in the course of a particle physics experiment, even, I mean, even in the course of talking about an electron orbiting the nucleus of the atom, you never have to take into account the gravitational attraction of the electron to the nucleus. In principle, you should. Yeah. But you get really damn good answers ignoring it. And that's because the masses in question are extremely tiny. Right. To get gravity to matter, you really need big masses. But the, the thing is, is when you get really big masses, you almost always find that really big objects are neutral. It's really hard to get really big charged objects. You can, and then you can do interesting, like I could charge you up, you know, and charge somebody else up, and we could do a grab, you know, but you even got to get things bigger than you to get gravity to really be, to be that interesting. So we, there's really just these fields where, or there's these two regimes where all the standard model physics is needed and gravity's not, and then where gravity's needed and the standard model physics is not. Of course, the exception to this is a black hole, and that's why people spend so much time studying black holes. 
because they're small, they're highly quantum mechanical, they're massive, they're very gravitational, and so they're sort of the, the, the best laboratory for sort of seeing how all of this stuff gets mushed together. Okay. And by the way, when we, when we do standard model physics, it's all quantum, and when we do gravity, for the most part, it's all classical. Uh, but of course, the fact that they exist together and the fact that there are these laboratories, like black holes, that are both small, quantum, and large and massive, means that we have to quantize everything at some point, and that's, of course, the problem of quantum gravity. Okay? Other questions? Yeah, Nathan. This might be kind of a question for afterward, but uh, uh, I remember, I think I was Kip Thorne or something was saying that there was like gravitational wave um, detection. You can get, uh, they were trying to detect gravitational wave signatures from the temperature breaking in the early universe. So is that something that I, that's predicted by the standard model or is it a general relativity thing? Or that's a, it's, it's, sure, sure, so the, um, so what you're really talking about in that context is uh, particle cosmology. So that's where you're really looking back. So cosmology is sort of a third branch of this where all of this gets put together because for cosmology you have to use general relativity because you're looking at the biggest system you can imagine in the entire universe and its evolution. And it's certainly got you know curved geometry and interesting things going on. Uh, so you use general relativity, but the evolution of the of the of the of the universe has involved some very important particle-related things. For example, uh, you know vacuum energies get created, um, and they course they give uh, contributions to the energy momentum tensor, which curves the space time in a particular way. Those vacuum energy uh, contributions can be traced uh, in part due to spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, procedures that have happened throughout the history of the universe. Um, and by the way, I only talked about the Higgs. If you go further back, there's the potentiality of having even more spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, events early in the universe, for example, if there are grand unified theories even earlier, and we'll talk about those in Physics X on Friday. Um, and so, so, for example, if you're looking for cosmological signatures of early universe things, you can see gravitational signals of particle physics like things, but this is happening on the cosmological scale. So when we talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking in the Higgs mechanism, we're not talking about a little thing over here. We're talking about the entire Higgs field throughout the universe changing from one value to another. And that's happening throughout the whole universe. And that's going to give you an appreciable gravitational signal. Okay. Yes. So when people say they're looking for quantum gravity, is kind of the general supersurface level idea they they're trying to find some way to manifest it as a symmetry under one of these or some other group? Well, general relativity is, is, a, is based on a, a gauge symmetry at the end of the day. So I should, I, well, first of all, I should be honest with you. Uh, pretty much nothing that I have said to date in this class has been quantum. It's really just been classical Lagrangians. We've talked about, you know, classical equations in motion. Uh, symmetries, these are all classical constructs. Now is the point where we're going to go to the quantum part of the story. Okay? But the reason I say that is because everything that I've said so far about these forces in the standard model, you can extend that discussion to gravitation. Now, the idea of creating gravity as a gauge theory is a little less straightforward because the gauge symmetry that you're actually trying to localize is this or actually the Poincaré group, or actually possibly translations. It gets really weird. Um, but generally speaking, there's a consensus that general relativity is also a gauge theory. Something being a gauge theory, though, doesn't make it quantum. You have to then quantize it. Mm -hmm. We can do that with these three in a consistent way. We can't do it with gravity in a consistent way. And the aim of the second half of this course is to get to renormalization where we'll see why gravity is a problem and these aren't. Okay, so that's that's the ultimate goal is to kind of see why quantum gravity is is a little problem child. Other questions? So Spencer's like, I'm gonna ask a question so bad. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. All right, so um, so here we go. We're going to uh, start. Um, doing some calculations, and, and again, the, the, the aim of the first part of this course was to really just kind of get an understanding of why the standard model Lagrangian looks the way it does. And I think you all, if you 
could relax about it a bit. You could all like say, wait a minute, I kind of know why the standard model Lagrangian looks the way it does. It's got a Klein-Gordon part because there's Higgs boson. It's got a bunch of Dirac parts because everything is, all the matter is spinners. It's got a bunch of Proca terms because of the gauge field. And then it's got all these interactions which might look complicated, especially the spontaneously broken ones, but at the end of the day, they're all given by gauge symmetry arguments, okay? The second part of the course, these calculations, I'm not gonna lie, you know, doing calculations can be a little dry, can be a little boring, a little tedious, you know? Um, but to me, the really interesting part about doing the calculations is, well, first of all, of course, for you, because you, you, you care, um, about whether things are right or wrong. Uh, you have to do calculations to make a prediction that you then measure against what you see in detectors and experience. So you have to verify that what you're doing is correct. I know everything that we're doing is correct because it's beautiful and it's based on symmetry arguments, but that, that, doesn't, that level of confidence doesn't work for the average physicist. For theorists, sometimes it works. Anyway, um, where we are going to go with this, as I mentioned in answer to Will's question, is, is it's in the process of doing calculations that we're going to uncover this phenomenon of renormalization. And renormalization is a very, very important observation in the standard model. It's a very, very important observation when we talk about could you fold gravity into the standard model. But it's actually a very important tool in all areas of physics. And it's actually the way that we connect physics at one scale to physics at another scale. Okay? So how do you start with like a, 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 a a crystal lattice where you're trying to describe every single electron and every single you know nucleon and and that's a really complicated problem to oh I can just kind of think of this as the in a continuum model and ignore a lot of the substructure and I can ask a lot of questions and get a lot of useful answers and that sort of that paradigm of moving from one uh, scale to a broader scale and what you can afford to ignore and so forth is part of the story of renormalization okay and we'll, we'll get into more details of that in, uh, in due time. Okay, so now I have to um, admit a great weakness. And that is that up until this point, we have been doing sort of formal development and we could rely on a lot of resources that are sort of more along the lines of what you would see in a quantum field theory course. Now we're going to start doing calculations which are more associated with the content of particle physics courses. And I know this is a particle physics course. We've kind of been you know, putting our hand in both pots. But the, the, the problem is that when you look at resources in particle physics, which many of you might want to look up at some point, like look on the internet at Wikipedia for various things that we're going to talk about or look at textbooks and so forth, particle physics uses a different set of conventions than we've been using. So we're going to adopt those from here on out. And I just want to very quickly lay down what those conventions are. And uh, here we go. So first of all, particle physicists uh, enjoy a mostly, or sorry, a mostly minus metric signature. Okay. So uh, we have hitherto been using the metric of Minkowski space to be minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one or the mostly plus, and particle physicists like to adopt the mostly minus. I really don't have a good, I mean, I can give you a motivation for why the mostly plus is gooder. I can't really justify why this is gooder, but anyway, somebody thinks it's gooder, so people use it. And yes, I know I'm saying gooder. I'm taking that word back. Okay, so what that of course means, if I have the components of a vector, and I form the dual vector, then now all of the spatial components get a minus sign instead of the time-like component getting a minus sign. And then, of course, this is reflected if I write uh, the invariant formed from a vector, because now the minuses appear again in front of all of the spatial terms. Okay, and uh, one thing to remember is that we have this expression for p mu p mu that we use a lot. And then that expression is going to have a sign change when we encounter it a little bit later on. Okay, Th this, all of this follows from this statement right here. Okay, now a couple of more places where uh, this uh, change comes about is in the Lagrangians for the Klein Gordon, the Dirac, and the Proca, and they're really just sign terms, nothing more. Um, and so we have one half d mu phi 
in your phi, and now it's going to have minus one half mc over h bar squared phi squared, where before it was plus. And then in the, in the equation that follows from that, that's going to be d mu d mu phi, and now we're going to have plus mc over h bar squared uh, phi equals zero in the Klein Gordon equation. So before this, we had a plus here, and then there was a minus there. Okay. Changing all of the, the metric uh, signature is going to have to force us to make that a minus and then make that a plus. And then it's basically sign changes for the rest of them as well. So the Dirac Lagrangian, which before it had minus mc squared psi bar psi, or sorry, before it had plus, now it's going to have minus. And the Dirac equation is going to now have a minus sign where before it had a plus. And then the Proca is now going to have a minus in front of the 1 over 16 pi f mu nu f mu nu, where before it had a plus. And then we'll still have the mass term. And it's going to lead us to essentially Maxwell's equations for the massive gauge field. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, I mean, everything I write from here on out is going to use these conventions, and you're probably not going to be too often tempted to dig back into the work we've done prior to this, with the exception of occasionally digging out the Dirac equation uh, or maybe the Proca equation. Okay, um, we will work with four vectors a lot, so. Uh, this change is going to pop up quite a bit when we do various kinematic calculations. And then one last place uh, where there's a change is in the definition of psi bar, where before it had a factor of i, now it does not. So psi bar before had uh, psi dagger gamma zero i, now it's just psi dagger gamma zero. There's the, there's the gooder right there. Huh? There's the gooder right there. Not having to deal with the imaginary. Okay, so um, so these are just convention changes. So when I write some expressions and you're like, wait a minute, isn't that supposed to be minus? Chances are uh, it's because of this change in convention. All right, so today we're going to just sort of kind of get started on uh, the framework of calculations. Oh, dear God. <laughs> and... Um, and then we're going to, uh, we're just going to keep trucking with this next time. Today is going to be a little on the dry side. It's important because it's, we're going to set up the framework for everything that's going to follow. But the next time we meet is where it's going to get more interesting, and that's the stuff that you all are more excited about seeing. Um, so if we're doing calculations that are relevant for experiment, for example, um, you might ask, well, what kinds of things do we want to calculate? And there are two types of phenomena that we tend to encounter. In particle physics experiments, there are decays, okay, where we have some massive thing and all of a sudden it disappears and you get some lighter things coming out. Okay? And then we have scattering. That's where we take more than one object and we kind of shoot them toward or near each other and they have some interaction and then stuff comes out. Okay? Now, decays are not something that we classically encounter. Like you might say, oh, I take a, a bomb and I, or a, a piece of rock and I blow it up and now I got two pieces of rock. That's a decay. <laughs> no, that's not a decay. A decay is when you genuinely start with one thing, like one type of particle, and then you uh, get different types of particles out, completely different particles. Okay? And the reason why we have, to, we have to go into particle physics to do this is because the only interaction that can really facilitate that is the weak interactions because it changes flavor. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so let me start up, let me start by setting up the framework of decays, and then we'll talk about scattering. So when I when I talk about decay, usually we'll just talk about a single uh, thing that's decaying. So I'll have some particle or field excitation A. And I will use the word particle a lot because this is the part of the course where we really are restricting ourselves to tiny particle-like fluctuations of the fields. So they are what we experience as particles. And what we discover is that when A decays, it can often decay into many different possibilities. 
So we could have A decay into B plus C. We could have it decay into D plus E where B and C and D and E are just different kinds of particles. Um, or we could have it decay into three things or, you know, just as many different things as you can think of, okay? There are, of course, some constraints. For example, uh, the total mass over here can't be uh, bigger than the mass that you start with because you would somehow be creating energy in the process of the decay, okay? Uh, but generally speaking, if you want to look at interesting or complex decay calculations, you want to start with a really massive thing, okay, like a W boson. It's pretty massive. Okay. It also turns out that if you start with the lightest thing, there's no way it can decay. Because if you have the lightest thing, there's nothing that it is lighter than it to decay into. So the lightest things are generally stable. Okay. Now, uh, you notice in this list, I did not include this option. A decays into B. Okay. Because a process like this is not an actual decay. Now, you can find terms in the Lagrangian which describe this, and in fact, in your last homework assignment, you did. When you expanded the Higgs Lagrangian around that funny solution, uh, phi 1 equals 1 over root 2 mu over, or mu over lambda, phi 2 equals 1 over root 2 mu over lambda, you ended up getting a term that was quadratic in the fluctuations. There was some constant out here. And what we're going to eventually discover when we do Feynman diagrams is that a term like this really does mediate this kind of process where an eta becomes a beta. Okay? But what that means is I literally just have this little eta particle floating along, and then at some point in, in space and time, it decides, oh no, you know what? I want to be a beta. Okay? That is not an interaction in sort of the canonical sense in which we'll deal with interactions in this course. What this kind of thing is really telling you is that these are really not distinguishable. You're, you're treating this situation with some funny variables that you shouldn't be using. And what you would discover with this particular example in the homework is that if instead of working with eta and beta, you actually worked with the linear combinations, then a couple of amazing things happen. And all of this is written up in detail in the solutions to the homework. First of all, if you work with these linear combinations, this term disappears. Secondly, one of these combinations, at the end of the day, has a mass, and the other one doesn't. Unlike what you found in your homework, where both eta and beta had mass. In truth, this combination has mass and corresponds to the Goldstone bo or the Higgs boson. This massless combination corresponds to the Goldstone boson. Okay. But again, I've written the details up in the, in the notes, uh, solutions for the, for the homework. But I just, it, in this context, I just want to point out, decays have to result in at least two decay products coming out. Okay. So we have all these possibilities for decays. And um, <coughs> we're going to just, to give each of these a name, we're going to call it a channel. I. So this is maybe the I equals 1 decay channel, the I equals 2 decay channel, the I equals 3 decay channel. And you know, there's as many of these as you go through and you figure out how many different kinds of particles that are lighter than this thing you can actually decay into. And then for each of these, there will be a decay rate where a decay rate um, is uh, one way to put it in words is to say that it is the probability per unit time to decay into something, okay? Where if I'm calculating gamma 1, it's the probability per unit time for A to decay into B plus C. If I'm calculating gamma 2, it's the probability per unit time of A decaying into D plus E, and so forth. And then, of course, we have gamma, all right, where the total gamma is the sum over all of the individual decay rates. And so the total gamma is simply the probability per unit time 
that A will decay at all. Okay? Okay? <coughs> now, um, if, you, if you have a sample of stuff, all right, so if you have some sample of stuff and you want to ask um, how is the number of that sample changing with time, well, it's, it's sort of intuitive that this is proportional to the total decay rate times the number of particles in your sample times the time interval over which you're looking, okay? Okay, decay rates are positive. If things are decaying, dn should be negative. The number of things should be getting smaller. So that's why there's a minus sign there. The more things you have to start with, the more decays you're gonna observe. So that's why n is there. And then the longer you observe, the longer dt is, the more decays you'll see, okay? So is everybody comfortable with this expression? You've hopefully seen this in quite a few contexts. And then of course, uh, you can take this and you can solve it to find the number uh, at any time based on the initial number that you start with and we just have uh, an exponential dependence on the decay rate. Okay. And then from this we define the average lifetime of something and that is the time uh, for the initial population to drop by a factor of 1 over e. Okay. So if after a time, one over gamma total, this is e to the minus one, so you've taken the initial amount and you've dropped it by a factor of one over e, and uh, that's how we define the average lifetime associated with this decay. Yes? Is it the same definition as a half-life, or just very similar? Well, if you define your half-life as the amount of time it takes for the population to drop by a factor of one over e, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> or like one over two. If you define it as 1 over 2, then no. We're not, that's, this, is a, this is a measure of how long-lived a sample is. I mean, half-life, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, it's a reasonable measure. It's just associating a characteristic time with this quantity. This quantity, of course, has units of inverse seconds. Okay. Now, notice you would never write this thing down using one of these. Because when you talk about half-life, you're saying, how long is this thing going to live? And you don't care what it decays into. So you're including all possible decay possibilities. Okay, so when we do calculations in this class, um, we will spend our time uh, focusing on calculating the gamma i's. Okay? So we'll look at particular channels and calculate the decay rates for those channels. Once you've gotten all of the decay rates that are relevant for whatever object you're starting with, then you can go and find the total decay rate and then from that extract the average lifetime if you like, okay? But the real hardcore calculation is in calculating these gamma i's. Okay. And I'll come back and, and flesh this out with some mathy stuff in just a few minutes, but for the moment, let's go ahead and talk about collisions. So um, for collisions, what we're interested in describing is the likelihood of an event of a particular collision event And again, a lot of this is going to be quite different than what you've studied in the past in terms of collisions, because a lot of times when you study collisions in the past, for example, in electromagnetic contexts, what comes out is what went in. That's not the case here. You can send two things in and get a whole different set of stuff coming out. Okay, so there's this whole, there's this whole catalog of decay chan or, or scattering channels that you can talk about. Um, but if we want to calculate the likelihood of a particular collision event, say, uh, A plus B goes to C plus D, um, where I'll call this the ith outcome. Um, we call this likelihood the scattering cross-section. Okay, which is a piece of uh, nomenclature you've probably heard before. 
Um, that's for the particular channel uh, going into C plus D. The total or inclusive uh, cross section for A plus B, where I don't care what comes out, is sigma total, which is again just the sum over all the individual sigmas. Okay. So again, we're going to focus on we're going to focus on calculating these sigma i's. So that is, we're going to set up a particular uh, set of end states and out states and then calculate the sigma I associated with that. And then you could just kind of go through the laundry list of all the possible outcomes. Once you've gone through done all the calculations, you can go and figure out, for example, the total scattering cross-section if you want. Um, and uh, this is the likelihood of, uh, of A plus B actually interacting with each other at all. Okay, the total scattering cross-section would reflect how likely is it for A and B to interact at all? Okay, now the, the, the notation cross section should be somewhat reminiscent. Um, if you just think about, you know, uh, if I've got an arrow, draw an arrow here. Oh, I can draw arrows so good. I took an extra special arrow drawing class just for this lecture. Um, and I'm shooting it at a target over here. And we all know this is a target because. It's got legs and it's standing in a field with a guy over here who's smiling with a hat on and he's holding a pole. It's actually a flag. And it's the United States of America and he's saying, Go America! <laughs> okay, all right. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. So, if you were to shoot this arrow at this target, the likelihood of the arrow hitting the target is at some level governed by the cross-sectional area of the target. The bigger the cross-sectional area of the target, the more likely the arrow is to hit it. Right? The smaller the cross-sectional, the less likely. Of course, this all has to do with your aim as well. Okay? Now, uh, that's the name cross-section, but in, in the context of these particle collisions, we have a much more general set of sort of collisions than this really sort of primitive example. So for, exa for, uh, for examples, we have uh, what are called soft targets. And that is, we don't actually have to have two things hit each other, right? We can actually have something that moves in the vicinity of another object and deflect, like you think of an object moving in the Coulomb potential of an atom or an object deflecting its trajectory in the gravitational potential of a planet. Okay, so here, here a collision is only if the arrow touches the target. If it misses, there's no collision, okay? But in physics, we're often dealing with these sort of softer targets. You just have to get near each other, deflect your path, and then you get some interesting results. Um, in particle physics, and in fact, in, in, in general physical collisions, uh, it depends on the arrow, okay? So I could take uh, two arrows, one is a neutrino and one is an electron, and shoot them at a proton, the proton's the same size. The proton's doing the same thing in both cases. But the scattering cross-section for an electron versus a neutrino is wildly different because the, the neutrino barely interacts at all. Yeah? So is this the case where like, you can represent soft, soft interactions like, with a mediating particle? Or is that something different? Um, no, I, I, yeah, you can do that. There's. So I want to be a little bit careful because there's a sense in which everything that we're going to do eventually gets at low energies uh, extrapolated into the, the field perspective that you're used to, the, the semi-classical perspective that you're used to doing calculations with. So when you say, I'm going to take an electron and shoot it toward a proton and I want to do the calculation of the scattering of the electron in the electric field of the proton, okay, that's a semi-classical calculation because you're you're, you're treating the field as sort of this continuous Coulombic field. You, you might even be doing a quantum mechanical treatment of the electron, but you're not quantizing the field of the, the, the electric field in that case. Here, everything is quantized. But at low energies, you should be reproducing the results that you get from that semi-classical perspective. In the quantum picture, though, there is this idea of 
particles, and I, I shudder to use the word touching because that's not really what we're going to describe, but it, it's, it is what it's going to seem like we're describing when we draw pictures. But the particles actually touch, and there's what we call a vertex, and we have two lines come in and maybe one or two lines come out. And so uh, there is a sense in which it's not soft, but it actually is, particularly if you take this low energy limit and you look at the semi-classical procedure. But I just want to be really careful to connect your intuition for things you've done with what we're eventually going to do here, because these calculations are uh, quite a bit more hairy, because everything's going to be quantum. Everything is going to be quantum. Well, uh, yeah. Well, that, that, that's just weird, right? Because then you can have, you don't have to conserve energy, right? Sure, you have to conserve energy. Oh. What? Uh, did so, I say uh, at some point I don't have to conserve energy? No, I mean, that's just what we learned in quantum mechanics. Oh, yeah, well, you know, quantum mechanics is wrong. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about non conservation of energy. It is going to pop up in a, in a way in the context of virtual particles. Okay? Yeah. But we'll, we'll get to that in time. It's not going to pop up today. Uh, the collisions we're going to talk about are velocity dependent. Here it doesn't matter how fast the arrow is going. The size of the target is the only thing that matters. Okay? But for us, and you already know this from semi classical limits, you know, if you shoot an electron at a proton and it's moving kind of slowly, it's going to have a very different deflection than if it's moving very, very quickly. In fact, if it's moving fast enough, it'll barely even see the, the, the proton. Sure. Okay? So there's velocity dependence in these scattering cross sections. And then, um, and then there's a whole different or a whole zoo of possibilities of what you mean by it hit or that in the scattering event two things actually hit because here you know you start with an arrow you start with a target you end with an arrow you end with a target whereas now we can have two things come together and the same two things come out different things come out so what it means to hit is is sort of more nebulous um, okay so there's lots of differences between this sort of simple classical collision scenario and the kinds of things that we're going to be studying and then the last sort of technical feature of this that I'll leave you with is um, when you're actually doing experiments, uh, often the total scattering cross-section is not something which is uh, easy to detect. Because when you have a scattering in an experiment, you often, for example, um, let's just say you're doing a fixed target experiment. So you've got a hunk of, of maybe gold and you're bombarding it with some heavy ions or something. So the heavy ions come in, they hit the hunk of gold, and then stuff comes out. And generally it comes out in all different directions, especially if this is a continuous beam and you've just got a bunch of stuff. So you've got stuff coming out in all directions, okay? Well, uh, there's one direction in which it's kind of hard to detect the stuff coming out of the collision. What direction is that? The direction, the direction in which the beam's coming in, okay? So, um, and then of course if you were doing a, a sort of a linear collider uh, where you just take two beams and you smash them against each other, then of course you've got these two beam lines that you can't measure. And then based on the actual device design, you actually end up finding that certain directions you can sort of orient and build your detectors to be more efficient than others. So it turns out to be, for experimental purposes, useful to define a quantity that we call the differential scattering cross-section which is we take a point, say the ostensible point of impact, and then we just look at a little angular wedge coming out of it, and then for that angular wedge, d omega, we can talk about <coughs> d sigma d omega as the differential scattering cross-section associated with the angular element, uh, the element of solid, differential solid angle d omega, okay? Of course, if you can get an expression for d sigma d omega, then you just integrate over all of d sigma and you get back the total sigma. As long as your collision is like equally spread about space. Well, no, 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 it's not uniform. So d sigma d omega is not a constant. But I'm saying, so, d, so in, an ex, in an experiment like this, where you have like two beams coming in at each other, what we can say is that d sigma d omega is going to depend on theta. Oh. It's generally going to change as you change theta, but it's not going to depend on phi normally, because phi is symmetric for these two beam lines, but theta is not. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so um, I'm going to flash two equations on the board, and then we're going to call it a day, because I really want to set us up for talking about Feynman diagrams when we come in on Thursday. So without any further ado, for both decays and scattering, we find the following useful expression. Um, First of all, we're looking for decay, individual decay rates for different channels and individual, individual uh, scattering cross-sections for different outcomes. And um, you might have done some calculations like this before in maybe in M class or maybe your intermediate mechanics class, maybe they're in your quantum, quantum mechanics class, but we are interested in calculating these for fully relativistic quantum fields which means that now we would stop and I would teach you quantum field theory. Okay, let's pretend we did that and just skip to the answer. And that's largely what we're going to do because unfortunately, as hard as everything we've done to this point is, quantizing it is even harder. So we're going to skip that formal step and we're going to go straight to the result of the quantization. And it turns out that it's you can actually wrap your head around and use the results without necessarily getting through the guts of the actual derivation. I, if any of you are going to work in this field, you have to at some point digest the breadth of quantum field theory, but for us, we're just going to kind of skip to the end. Um, and a, a, a useful first observation is that both um, depend on roughly two different factors. The first factor is kinematic considerations. Um, and kinematic considerations are roughly tied to the idea of the phase space degrees of freedom. So for example, and this is just an example, there's lots of kinematic configurations that go on. Um, so for example, uh, if I'm looking at a collision and I'm thinking about possible outcomes, the the uh, cross-section of an outcome which is only possible by violating energy momentum conservation is automatically zero because energy momentum conservation is a part of physics. So you could write, <laughs> I see that look, Kowalski. So you could say, or, or here's another example, if I'm thinking about a decay of an orangutan into an elephant, the decay rate for that process is zero because an orangutan is usually lighter than an elephant. Effectively. <laughs> Effectively, okay. Um, so uh, another, another interesting uh, reflection of kinematic considerations is if I have a very massive thing and it decays into another object which is very close in mass, then generally speaking, the, f the amount of phase space degrees of freedom is smaller than if a very massive thing decays into something very light. Because when you have a massive thing decay into something very light, you get a lot of extra energy and momentum that's liberated, or you have a lot of energy that's liberated. Uh, the total momentum would be zero if it was at rest. But you get a lot of energy that's liberated, and there's lots of ways to distribute that leftover energy. So you have a lot of phase space to work with. Yeah. If you have a massive thing decay into something that's just a hair less massive, you have a very small amount of energy to distribute. So you have less phase space. That is reflected in the likelihood. You're more likely to decay into smaller things than into something that's just slightly less massive. Okay. Um, the other reflection is, or the other characteristic of, of all of these is dynamics. And dynamics is where we talk about the particular interactions. So is it the strong interaction? Is it the weak interaction? Um, and in particular, this is also where we're going to find the role played by intermediate states or virtual particles. So particles which only exist sort of in this quantum interim. They're not observed, they're not part of what you put in, they're not a part of what you observe coming out, but they must be included in sort of the intermediate part of the story in order to get the right answer. Okay. And the reason I put this down in the dynamics is because these intermediate states are typically not going to have to satisfy the same kinematic constraints as the real, physical, observable particles. Okay, well, uh, I was going to write down an equation, 
But now that we've lost a couple of people and we're over time, I think this is going to have to wait until next time. So we'll kick off next time with Fermi's Golden Rule, and then we'll go ahead and start applying it in the context of uh, Toy Theory, writing down Feynman diagrams before we move into the next Rule. So see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>